Good evening, everyone. Good to be back with you. Uh, last time we finished up uh, Daniel chapter 12. And for those that tuned into our church service this past Sabbath, um, I told you that we were going to start a new topic and wasn't going to share what it is. So let's uh, get into it today, actually. So why don't we start with a word of prayer? And then we'll talk about this this subject here tonight. So, Holy Father, just uh, be with us now as we go into Your Word. I just ask that Your Holy Spirit would would guide this um, time together as we look through this time in history. And so, I just ask for Your Spirit again in Jesus' name. We pray, Amen. Well, if you're wondering where we're going to be studying. It is the book of Joel. Book of Joel. And so if you've got your Bibles, uh, you can turn there. I want to talk to you a little bit about some things. You, some of you might have this. This was a, a chart that I had put together some time ago. I don't know if anybody remembers this. I know it's backwards for you. But uh, this was a chart that I had put together a number of years ago where it goes through and it shows you the kingdom, northern and southern kingdom after David and Solomon and how the kingdom was broken into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And when you go through each of these kings of Israel, it's Jeroboam, Nadab, uh, each one of them, I give them all thumbs down, every last one of them, all the way down until they're assimilated by Assyria in 722 B.C. On the other side in Judah, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. There are times where things are, are well there are other times where things are, are not well. Uh, there are times where you get Ahaz, and it's, it's very bad. Uh, you get other ones with Hezekiah, did fairly well until the end of his life. Uh, Manasseh, actually thumbs down until the end of his life. Josiah, the, you know, thumbs up for, for his life of restoring and moving out of the idolatry and, and knocking down things. Uh, when you look at Joel... Uh, Joel is in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now remember, uh, it was the northern kingdom of Israel that was assimilated by Assyria in 722 B.C. Uh, Joel is likely, there are some that put him later than that, but to me it doesn't fit correctly. Uh, Joel would be before that happened, um, and he does some warnings that we're going to look at as we look through this. We'll spend the next three weeks doing this. Today we'll look at Joel chapter 1. Uh, next week we'll do Joel 2. And then the third week we'll do Joel 3. You'll find I think it's, it's very, um, very important to look at this uh, because it really does parallel much of what we're dealing with today, not just with the COVID-19, but just in general looking at Matthew 24. Um, but Joel is sometime probably around um, 800s B.C. Uh, Athalia was the queen. She was queen around 841 to 835. He doesn't ever mention any king, so you're not 100% certain. But it could be the reason why there's no kings mentioned, because there is no king, because she was the one queen that lasted for about seven years, between 841 and 835 B.C., so... It's quite possible that he was uh, speaking during her reign. But anyway, it was on a downside. You had Jehoram, you had Az uh, Ahaziah, and then you had Athaliah, and all three of them. So you're looking at about 15 years of, of down in the nation of Judah. It's not till after her that Joash comes in and has 40 years of kind of seemingly good, kind of mixed bag, as well, but Amos, or I mean uh, Amos, is also one that comes after Joel, uh, Isaiah, Jonah. All of them are afterwards. Joel could have been. I don't know if he was alive at the same time of Elijah and Elisha. I'm not certain, but they could have been very close to each other. Again, Elijah and Elisha were in the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, Joel is in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Elisha and Joel possibly. Could have been contemporaries, but there's again, there's no mention in either of them during during that time. Um, but there's a major crisis that is happening. I don't think we're going to deal with this anymore. I just want to kind of give a 
kind of a situation of where that timeline would have would have fit. Um, but if you've got your Bible, hopefully you've gotten to Joel chapter one. Uh, it's it's a very interesting language that he describes here. Um, I was looking at different translations. Uh, there's nothing really difficult in what he that he says here, but I'm just going to use the the nice flowing uh, New Living Translation as I read through Joel chapter one with you. And so let's just let's just read through it first. Uh, the the uh, the 20 verses that are in here, and then we'll kind of come back and and talk about it a little bit more. So let's just start with Joel chapter 1, verse 1. So the Lord gave this message to Joel, son of Pethuel. Uh, Again, we don't even know who that is either. It just tells you who his father is. No other mention anywhere else. So he says there in verse 2, Hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land. In all your history, has anything like this happened before? Tell your children about it in the years to come. And let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. After the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts took what was left. So you can see here what he's saying is there is nothing that's ever been seen like this before. There is a major locust plague that is happening here. And uh, it says that, verse 4, that after the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts, took what was left. After them came hopping locusts, and then the stripping locusts too. So this is a major, major type of situation, the crisis that is happening here for them. Verse 5 says, Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. All the grapes are ruined, and all of your sweet wine is gone. A vast army of locusts has invaded my land. A terrible army too numerous to count. Its teeth are like lion's teeth, its fangs like those of a lioness. It has destroyed my grapevines and ruined my fig trees, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving the branches white and bare. Weep like a bride dressed in black, mourning the death of her husband. For there is no grain or wine to offer at the temple of the Lord. So the priests are in mourning. The ministers of the Lord are weeping. The fields are ruined. The land is stripped bare. The grain is destroyed. The uh, the grapes have shriveled. And the oil, olive oil, is gone. Despair all you farmers. Wail are you all you vine growers. Weep because the wheat and barley, all the crops of the field, are ruined. The grapevines have dried up and the fig trees have withered. The pomegranate trees, palm trees, and apple trees, all the fruit trees have dried up, and the people's joy has dried up with them. Dress yourselves in burlap and weep, you priests. Wail, you who serve before the altar. Come spend the night in burlap, you ministers of my God, for there is no grain or wine to offer at the temple of your God. Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. Bring the leaders and all the people of the land into the temple of the Lord your God and cry out to him there. The day of the Lord is near. The day when destruction comes from the Almighty. How terrible that day will be. Our food disappears before our very eyes. No joyful celebrations are held in the house of our God. The seeds die in the parched ground and the grain Crops fail. The barns stand empty, and granaries are abandoned. How the animals moan with hunger, the herd of cattle wander about confused, because they have no pasture. The flocks of sheep and goats bleat in misery. Lord, help us. The fire has consumed the wilderness pastures, and flames have burned up all the trees. Even the wild animals cry out to you, because the streams have dried up and fire has consumed the wilderness passages. A pasture. So what's interesting here is there is there seems to be this cry, right, for the inhabitants. All of these things have happened. The locusts have done all of this damage. They're having a famine. Um, 
I mean, it's a it's a really bad bad situation. I'll have to lean forward a few times because my computer wants to go to sleep. So the uh, the swarming locusts have done all this. The nation is going through all of this stuff. It's interesting, just as a side note, that when it talks about the teeth are the teeth of a lion, and this is in verse six, and uh, he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. When it starts talking about the lion and all this, it kind of reminds you, if you haven't uh, noticed, this is the interesting thing. The more you immerse yourself in the Word of God, the more that you begin to see the parallels in Scripture. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. For instance, if you were to turn real quickly to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 9, it has a seemingly uh, a type of... A famine there too, because here it's got grass and earth being destroyed. It's using a different animal. It's um, it's using a scorpion and such, but locust is still in there. Um, because if you go down, you'll notice that in verse seven of Revelation nine, there's a locust, and this locust has the teeth, verse eight, of a lion. And so it's interesting, I believe what John's doing is he is recognizing the story in the book of, of Joel, and he's using it there in the book of Revelation. So there seems to be this connection between locust and nation. Uh, because you'll notice as Joel is reading, uh, or as we're reading, and as Joel is speaking this, and he's mourning for the land, and he's calling all these people to come together and to cry out, it seems to be this idea of nation, like the day of the Lord is at hand. This is in verse 15. The day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. So it, it's almost like there is this connection between, okay, imagine it like this. Joel is out there, and, and again, we have to look at it from the, the literal perspective, okay? When John writes in Revelation 9, I believe he's got a specific thing in mind. I don't think he's literally going through a locust plague or, or a crisis like he is here in Joel. But you imagine it like this, that Joel is in this literal situation where everything around him is being destroyed, eaten by locusts. All the trees are dying from famine and, and dry, dryness and all this. But as he's experiencing this all around him, it brings to mind the reality that this thing is going to happen one day as well because the day of the Lord is going to happen. And so as this is why I think this is so important for us to look at this. As I've already said, COVID-19 is not the end. But COVID-19 is Matthew 24. And we know that in the last days, as we soon approach the coming of Christ, that all of the events of Matthew 24 will happen in, in faster succession. And things will happen quickly. And so when we look at COVID-19 or any other of the things, wars and rumors of wars and nations against nations and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, that these things will continue to happen much quickly, uh, quickly, or quicklier, I guess that's not even a real word, but uh, faster as time closes. So I, I can see Joel standing out there and seeing all of this destruction happening around him and saying, man, this is, is, is interesting of how this is happening. And, and really it really pales in comparison to what's going to happen in the future. But it really gets them thinking. I mean, you think about it. Jeremiah has a similar situation where they're taken into captivity, and and he's given the opportunity to by Nebuchadnezzar to come uh, to Babylon or to stay in Jerusalem. And he chooses to stay in Jerusalem, and then he writes the book of Lamentations, and he sees the de decimation of of Jerusalem and the temple. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that these things that are happening today are not the end. But they should certainly remind us, or at least bring our minds to the reality of where we are in Earth's history. And it should get us thinking about the, how the future crisis uh, uh, may go. Uh, you know, for instance, when it starts talking about the, the fruit trees, 
Um, this is a major problem because as he's going through here and he's talking about the fruit trees, you'll notice there in verse 12, the vine has dried up, the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree. When you read about the actual, many, not all, but many of the fruit trees in Palestine, they take 20 years to grow and become productive. So if all of these fruit trees are withering, it is not a quick fix. It's going to be some years before things are going to be productive again. So you look at what we're dealing right now with this pandemic, what could be the long-term effect of the things that we're dealing with? And if things continue to get worse, not necessarily with this pandemic, but other wars and rumors of wars and nations against nations and earthquakes in various places, could those kinds of things have such devastation that the, the, the opportunity for production could be very difficult. Uh, and, you know, it could be a very, very bad. Uh, like it says there at the end of verse 12, that things are going to wither away. And it says in verse 13, to gird yourselves. You know, and this is important. Are you preparing? And I don't mean, again, this is important. Yes, he's talking about preparing yourself for these kinds of things. But if this has already happened, if all of these things have already taken place, then the girding of yourself, the coming together and praying and consecrating and fasting, this is not going to suddenly bring production faster than the 20 years it's needed for these things to grow. He's talking about a spiritual condition. So in the situation that we're in today, with all the devastation and the hardship, and as it continues to get worse. Now, could there could it be possible that there could be, after this situation, prosperity again for 20 years? Absolutely. But again, when they, what's it say? When they say pre, uh, uh, peace and safety, sudden destruction. And so, again, we need to be consecrating ourselves. We need to be praying. We need to be growing in our relationship with God spiritually. Um... Again, he says there, also, if you were to go back to the Old Testament, books like Deuteronomy and others, um, you know, grapes, grain, oil, they were, they were dietary staples. Uh, wheat and barley was a very important grain in Palestine. Vines and fig trees, they symbolize peaceful living with an abundance of God's blessing in the promised land. And suddenly, all these things are, are now being uh, destroyed, and there is this great plague. But again, he draws the importance, if you notice again, he draws the importance of verse 15, the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. So again, the reality of our future is going to be greater, right? It's going to be worse. Remember when it talks about it in, in Daniel 12.1, the time of trouble is going to be worse that's ever been on this planet. So even if we do see some prosperity after this COVID-19, again, the reality of Scripture, the, the prophetic you know, utterances from Scripture tell us that ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, things are not going to get better, at least not for the people of God. Um, it's going to get worse. And we're going to see a situation unparalleled. In, in Earth's history. But at the same time, it's important for us that even though it's going to be bad and unparalleled, we still need to be faithful. Uh, we still need to uh, to view our relationship with God. You know, and, and, and Peter even says that, knowing these things, what kind of people ought we to be living lives of holiness and godliness? So it's important for us to see that. But there were a couple of things that I, that I was looking at this week, and it's actually going to be working its way into the sermon that I'm preaching this Sabbath, so I won't share uh, too much here today or tonight during this uh, this study together, because I'm going to be, so tune in on Sabbath uh, for that. But I was looking at a couple places in Earth's history, uh, in our past, uh, in the late, well, early, early 1800s to late 1900s, and there were two situations, well, it's really one situation, but two a different accounts of it about what happened in 1837. 
1837, there was what we would call, for us, knowing it now scientifically, as the Aurora Borealis. Uh, and now, the Aurora Borealis, if you don't know, is the Northern Lights. And there was an Adventist minister by the name of John Loughborough. Uh, he was born in 1832 and died in 1924. And I was reading some of his accounts of, of this situation. And this is what he says. He says, In the work entitled Modern Phenomena of the Heavens are two accounts of the wonderful fiery aurora of January 25th, 1837. The first reads, um, well, again, we go, the first reads, another instance of that, of, of this phenomenon was extensively witnessed in the country of America early in the evening, January 25th, 1837, when as described by many, the very heavens for a short time seemed to be on fire. And when the snow upon the ground much resembled blood and fire, which was so alarming in appearance as to cause the solemn inquiry with some who were out at the time, if the day of judgment had come, and also to cause the animals even to tremble with fear. In one place near a mountain, the people informed me that on the snow there was the appearance of waves of fire rolling, rolling down the mountain. The second statement from above work in respecting the aurora in, in January 25th, 1837, and as it appeared in the state of Massachusetts. A clergyman of Massachusetts gave me the account, the following account, of the same phenomenon as he and others witnessed in one of the towns of Cape Cod in that state. He was sitting with another minister in the pulpit who had just commenced a discourse on the subject of the final judgment to the crowded audience of a protracted meeting, when suddenly, through the windows, the whole house was filled with the most vivid and fiery light, so alarming in its appearance that several of the audience shrieked aloud. All was disorder and commotion. Many rushed to the doors in all prospect of further worship, for the time seemed to be lost. To one from without, perceiving the consternation within, forced his way through the astonished crowd up to the desk, with an account of the aurora phenomenon, just witnessed by those out of doors. Then this clergyman, as he said, called attention and informed the audience that he had more cause for admiration than alarm, and that the appearance that they had witnessed was but a beautiful and unusually splendid exhibition of the aurora borealis which the Lord had been giving them. Now, in that situation, it was a small group, even though it was the media wasn't able to generate the same things that we get today. Because I am sure that many have preached sermons now stating, oh, COVID-19 is the little time of trouble. It's a time of trouble, and, and we need the God's judgments coming, and the second coming, we need to get ready. And the media gets it, and the Facebook gets it, and there's this huge swarm of people saying, you know, we're, we're there. Where are you with... Back then, it didn't have the same media frenzy as, as we have today. But that one man was able to come forward and say, no, wait a second, this is the Aurora Borealis. But at the same time, it still caused people to stop for a moment and think. Um, and it brought them to their senses. It got their attention. Um, back in 2015, the Advent Review had posted this, uh, this event, the same event in 1837, and I want to read it to you because I think it's really good. It says this uh, in the Advent Review. On the Wednesday evening of January 25th, 1837, startled residents of the New England states saw the evening sky light up in a glowing deep red color. Eyewitnesses said that the red color seemed to dance in waves across the snow-covered ground. Many people were terrified at this unusual display of the northern lights or aurora borealis, but not... Nine-year-old Ellen, Mrs. Ellen White, at the time Ellen Harmon. Ellen was recovering from a severe accident and was bedridden. She couldn't get up, but she could watch the strange lights reflecting through her bedroom window. And while others may have been terror-struck, Ellen felt sheer joy because she thought it was the second coming of Christ. Longing and working toward that great event is something she would do all of her life. 
So who was this young girl who was so eagerly awaiting the second coming of Jesus? We know who that is. But then it goes on in this article to say, For some Adventists, a belief in the soon coming of Jesus seemed to lead to fanaticism. But Ellen White insisted on a belief firmly anchored in Scripture and not based on emotional hype. This is important. As I shared with you last week, there are still events that need to transpire that haven't, haven't even happened yet. So COVID-19, we should not allow it to lead us to fanaticism and emotional hype. But at the same time, what does it do? It brings this sense of, of okay, where are we at in Earth's history? It gets our attention. But the attention it should get us to is not, uh-oh, Jesus, where is he, where is he? But where are we at spiritually in our lives? You know, that's what it should do. It should cause us to get on our knees. It should cause us to say, you know what, this, this is a reality. Just like Joel is. He's there looking at this plague. He's looking at all these locusts, and he's seeing the devastation and the chaos that is happening but in this crisis. But there's also a spiritual response that he has to to this crisis because if you notice there go back to your to uh, Joel Joel chapter 1 he says gird yourselves and lament you priests wail you who minister before the altar it's almost like he recognizes that even though this thing is happening that there is also a spiritual famine there is a spiritual crisis that's going on inside the land. And the reality is it doesn't get better. It continues to get worse. When I showed you the, the prophetic or the prophet timeline, after, after uh, Joel, you've got Amos preaching the same things through Azariah and Amaziah. Uh, now, there is, for 16 years, there is a, a surge because you get Jotham that comes in 750 to 735. But as all of this seems to get better for a short time, it does not do well. Now, even though Josiah comes, okay, but that's after Josiah is 640 to 609. That was 31 years of, of prosperity that goes on. But even though there's prosperity from 640 to 609, the northern kingdom of Israel has already been assimilated by Assyria in 722. So, again, Joel is, is speaking to all of them. Israel doesn't listen. They get assimilated. They're gone. Even though uh, Joel is preaching this, they're not doing very well. And even though Josiah does 31 years of prosperity, of bringing them back in relationship with God, by, five, well, by 605, what do we have? Right? Babylon comes in. Judah gets exiled. 586 is what brings the final destruction of Jerusalem. So it's been very important. Again, when you look at the New Testament, it says, you know, peace, 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 and then sudden destruction. But his response is to pray. The spiritual condition would change. If you were there, a part of my, my sermon this past week, I shade that the, the circumstances may not change, but the attitude does. So again, as he's praying here, it, the prayer doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden, in one year, all of this devastation, all of this crisis is going to change, but the mindset can, right? The spiritual condition can change in the hearts of the people. And so it's important for us to see that. He goes again, look at this. Um, again, in Joel chapter 2, Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate and fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land. This is kind of a sad situation because shouldn't this be the reality of God's people anyway? Think about this for a minute. Should we wait until crisis to have prayer? Should we wait 
until the spiritual, you know, until the situation in the land is what it is to have a spiritual situation to happen in our lives, that shouldn't be it. Because once probation closes and there is a seemingly spiritual condition, it's too late, isn't it? And so we need to recognize uh, where we are uh, in Earth's history and have that spiritual uh, reality in, in our lives. I don't know why it's sleeping as much as it is last week when I did this. I think it only slept once. But, you know, I'll just keep reaching up and touching it so it doesn't uh, go to sleep for the recording. But it says there to come to the sacred assembly. All the inhabitants are like, cry out to the Lord. Uh, verse 15 says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. So he's, he's saying, you know what? We need to recognize where we are. These things are happening all around us. And we need to recognize the, the spiritual uh, situation. So in our crisis right now, if, even if you want to call it a crisis, a pandemic or such, where should we be? Should we be people of prayer? Should we, like I preached this last week, should we be bearing each other's burdens? Should we be spending time with each other on the phone, through the internet, uh, through sending letters? I wrote some thoughts down that I want to share with you. And that is this one. The prophet urges the spiritual leaders to call a nationwide day of prayer and fasting so that the people can search deep within their hearts and renounce their sins and return to their God. You know, things seem to have withered, it says there in verse 17. It's even affecting the cattle. The cattle are restless because there is no pasture. The flocks of sheep are suffering punishment. Everything is being affected by this. But at the same time this crisis is going on, what can our prayers bring? What can bearing each other's burdens bring? It can bring joy. Now, it may not change the circumstance. There could be still people that are dying. There can be still people that are suffering. But the mindset changes. The spiritual condition changes. My second thought that I was thinking of is, in this way, by using this prayer and renouncing the sins and returning to God and having that spiritual reality in life, in this way they will come out of the experience with a renewed trust in God's love. In the end, this disaster might lead the believers into a deeper relationship. Would you say the word might? No, I would say, in the end, this disaster will lead the believers into a deeper relationship with, with God. And so through this situation, and this is the question, this is what I'm going to be preaching on of this coming week, is it authentic? You know, is, is it necessarily people being scared into the church? And does being scared into the church last? Is there longevity? Um, are you just coming in for believing that you are safe? Jeremiah preached that on the steps of the temple and said, you guys keep coming in here and making your sacrifices and doing all these things, but then you're leaving here and going about and doing the sinful things in the life that you once lived. There has really never been any real transfer there, or, or change or, or transformation of the inner life. I think that's what we need to be careful of. Are we coming in just because of the safety, or are we coming in because we truly want a transformation inside of our lives? And so that deeper relationship with God causes us, right? The closer that we get to God, the more we see our, our weaknesses, the more we see our need of Christ. And so my third thought is this. Throughout Scripture, God is described as the Lord of nature, the one who created, the one who sustains it. And he also uses it for his divine purposes. In this natural disaster in Joel, instead of having, notice this, instead of having them render their garments, the prophet tells them to rend their hearts. You know, and so I think, is that not the reality for you and I here in our, our present circumstance? Is that instead of rendering our garments, 
that we should be rendering our hearts. It says right there, verse 19, O Lord, to you I cry out, for the fire has, has devoured the open pastures, the flame has burned all the trees of the field, the beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the waters of brooks are dried up and the, fi the fire has, has devoured their pastures. But to you I cry out. And I think that's just kind of the reality for you and I. As we are in this pandemic, and I'm sure that even though we may see peace, 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 we know that there will be sudden destruction. And we need to ask ourselves, are we rending our hearts? And here's the thing. Not only are we rending our hearts, but by bearing each other's burdens. And it's not just us within our church. It's also those outside our walls of sounding the alarm. That's what it says. Sounding the alarm. Preaching the gospel, right? When you go through Revelation chapter 14, the three angels' message, it's sounding the alarm. It's telling people where we are in earth's history. And as we look at all of the devastation, all the things that are going to get worse and worse, but it calls us to our senses. It gets our attention. And it tells us to wake up. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to be going in. This is just Joel 1. He's kind of telling you the situation. He's kind of waking you up. He's bringing you to your senses. And as we continue to go through this, I don't know what the long-term situation will be with this. Some are now saying we may be back uh, in April sometime. I've heard now maybe late April. Uh, what's going to be long? I, I don't know. But we're going to continue to do this through the Internet of each midweek study and prayer together. We're going to continue to do our live streaming. We're going to continue to make the phone calls and send the letters and stay connected. We're going to continue to do Bible studies. Yeah, we can still do Bible studies. That's not going to keep us from doing that. And so we continue to keep this in prayer and recognize that God is in control. God is at the wheel, and he will see us through. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful for all that you do. I am grateful that you're at the wheel, that you're at the helm. And Lord, in each of our lives, as we look at these situations, it brings us to where our senses, it gets our attention, and it wakes us up. As we go through even Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and we see the seven churches, there are many things that they're doing right, but then, the God, you have things that you remind them that they need to improve. And I'm sure it's the same in each of our lives. I know it's mine. That there are things that I am doing right, but there are things that I can still do better. And so, Lord, I ask in each of the persons that's watching this, and in my life as well, that we'll continue to pray, that we'll continue to grow ever closer to you as our faith increases, as things go different. Even though our circumstances may not change, our attitude will, because we know that you're in control. So continue to be with us. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, I, I challenge you to come and find us on YouTube. If you don't know how to find us, go to YouTube and look up York SDA Church. You'll find us in there. Come and join us Sabbath mornings for our Sabbath school class at 10 a.m. And then our church service at 1115. And I'll continue to post these each midweek so that we can still spend time together. All right, take care and God bless.